Hi, and welcome to Macro Monday. When we talk macro, trying to make sense of markets, and eh, they don't really make any sense. But more importantly, answer your questions so we become better investors. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today because we're going to try to answer the question of what's going on with the dollar. Because bonds lead the dollar higher, and I'm going to show you, and it's going to blow people away because the market is super bearish on the dollar. They're crazy bullish on gold, crazy bullish on commodities, and everybody is leaving the dollar for dead. And I think they're wrong in a big way. Now, last week, I did a whole episode on the dollar. We're going to continue that a little bit more today with some charts. But first, let's get into the macroeconomic data for the day. And we don't have a whole lot. We have uh, out of Hong Kong, exports and imports on a month over month basis, still headed lower, not a positive sign for Hong Kong and of course the rest of the world. And uh, looking at durable goods, new orders on a month over month basis, nice move higher at 7.3%, still at a negative on a year over year basis, I think around minus 10% or 10.8, somewhere in there. Stripping out food and energy, durable goods or core durable goods orders, we're up 3.3%, excluding defense, up 9.2%, and ex non-defense, excluding air, was up 3.3%. Now, let's go into the actual part of the durable goods that I think is more important is what's going on with the consumer. And it's really all that matters in the U.S. economy is what's going on with the consumer. Now, in this chart, uh, courtesy of Chris Dark, we have new orders for consumer goods, which is durable goods, excluding defense industries, less new orders for durable goods, um, transportation equipment of non-defense aircraft and parts. Essentially, what part of durable goods that are being ordered are for the consumer? And I've got this next to the cash freight index. And I like the cash freight index because it says a lot. When something is being shipped, out of the factory, well, it's gonna show up in the freight index. And if the freight index is still declining and it has not bottomed yet, well, then the new orders are going to eventually turn around and head lower. So what we see in red is cast freight. It's still in a downward trend, but new orders and list seem to be making a, not quite a V-shaped recovery, but a very sharp recovery compared to past market or recession. So we look at the, uh, the dot-com bubble, and you notice it took several months for new orders to bottom out. Same with the, dot, the great financial crisis, but now everyone says, hey, we're, we're past multiple month bottoms and recessions. Now we only need a V-shaped recovery. But look, even at the consumer level, it's down, still down about 6.9%. The question is, is this rolling over or is it going to head higher? I think it, I think it rolls over. Let's get back to the economic data. That's not it. How about, well, you know what? That was it. All right. And <laughs> moving on to today's auctions, we had a two-year note. Auction was met with pretty weak demand as auctions go. We had a five-year note auction also met with weak demand, and that sent treasury yields uh, higher on the day. But does it really tell us the demand for treasuries is dead. No, not at all. We've seen prior auctions where you know, short-term debt is just not that interesting for foreign investors. We've seen foreign investors have a strong bias on the 7, 10, especially the 30 year. But let's go out and look today at the New York Fed because they updated their QE schedule. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Now I did the math between the two auctions and approximately $33 billion and touch over that was taken by the securities dealers. Let's figure out how long they're gonna have that for. I don't think very long. So the New York Fed announced today, effectively no changes to their quantitative easing purchases. I shouldn't say effectively, they offer no changes to it. In fact, I'm looking at the schedule uh, going into mid-August and it looks strikingly just like the schedule we just came out of. And so $33 billion between two to five year maturity. Well, coming up tomorrow, they're going to grab 12.8 billion of everything under two year and then we've got uh, another one that's going to pick up some five years because they're buying under four and a half which would be some that are five years that are more than six months old so there's 20 billion that they could be grabbing 
And then we've got, let's see, a four and a half to seven down here, six billion. My point being with this is granted, these are not gonna buy up all the supply that was that just hit the treasury dealer's hands or the securities dealer's hands. My point is by the end of August, it will have. And that's what's aggressive about the Fed schedule here is they're picking up all this new supply. Not immediately, but they're grabbing it by the end of the month. How about the long bond? There's gonna be one, two, three long bond purchases at 1.75 billion starting on, this is gonna be Thursday and going into August 12th. So that's excellent. This is still, the Fed is the biggest hand in the market here. And this is real important because we've got a uh, FOMC meeting starting tomorrow. That's why there's no QE auction on Wednesday because we'll have the Powell presser. And I'm going to actually give you a full prediction of what is going to happen on Wednesday. First of all, there will be no changes to mon monetary policy, no changes to the federal funds rate, no changes to the QE program. Powell will then go on to say that there's only so much monetary policy can do. He will encourage more fiscal stimulus, even though he'll probably say he has nothing to do with that, which is true, but he will suggest that really the fiscal side needs to do more. He'll probably complain about there being too much debt, too late now, and he will make a comment that the market will interpret, interpret as inflationary, and he will say the Fed is going to allow inflation the next time around to exceed 2% before they start tightening. And the market is going to immediately act like, oh my God, the Fed thinks their policies are going to create 2% inflation. No, it's going to be misinterpreted that way. The, the actual answer is if it should ever get there, and it certainly is not going to get there in the near future or even in the intermediate future, or maybe in the long-term future, but if it ever gets there, they're going to let it run a little hot simply because they don't have anything else to say. They need to get people to believe that inflation is coming. It's not quantitative easing. It's highly deflationary. And it leads to lower long-term interest rates. And the consumer price index, well, it follows yield lower. So we already know that falling yields tighten financial conditions and tight financial conditions lead to lower consumer prices. That's your outlook for Wednesday. Now, of course, when we do come back in the Wednesday video, we'll talk about that and we'll just see how close to the prediction I got. I'm, I'm feeling about 100% on this because what else can Powell do? I mean, he can't go out and do more QE right now because the data says the economy is, is looking better. It's right, the economy's got a kind of bullish tone to it. Now, what do I think? I think we're gonna see a massive rollover in the economy, but Powell can't do anything because he's supposedly data-driven. Well, it is what it is with that. Let's take a look at how hedge funds are positioned in the market, and then we'll take a look at some charts. And you can see why I'm still super bond bullish. 10-year uh, treasury note futures, hedge funds backed off their longs a little bit. Again, they've got a lot more long positions to take before we see a, a bottom in the 10-year. So there's a ways to go on that. How about the 30-year? As of Tuesday, they're still deeply short. And can you imagine where the 30-year is going as it's on the cusp of breaking down and heading to m revisit its all-time low and perhaps on its way to zero? How much of the market... The bonds or how many bonds the hedge funds are going to have to buy when they go long, when they shoot these position longs, how deep will that take 10 year or 30 year treasuries? I'm suspecting I'm going to look very right on that call. How about WTI? No real change in hedge funds. They remain very long oil, even as demand is really not there at all. S&P 500, there's increased their shorts slightly as the S&P is flirting with uh, its top from back in uh looks like i don't know a couple months ago or a month ago as far as the euro now we normally don't talk about the euro but i've got to talk about the euro because the euro is massively extended not in, just in the value of the euro relative but in terms of speculative positioning so the markets have been very long the euro very long gold and they're pretty short the dollar Wherever the dollar is, here it is, and they're short the dollar. Now, everybody thinks the dollar is left for dead at this point. And let's face it, when you have a world that has dollar-denominated debts, guess what people are going to need at some point? They're going to need dollars. So the fact that everyone's betting on the euro right now in gold, 
it's just another part of my broad thesis that people are on the wrong side of this. And I know some people think, oh man, I missed out on the gold thing. I, I don't think that at all. I'll show you why. And when we get to the charts, but I just want to point out here, the, the euro is very overextended in terms of speculative positioning. And you get start getting an unwind in those euro longs and you'll then see a reversal in gold and a reversal in the dollar. How about the NASDAQ? Uh, speculators backed off their long positions quite a bit in terms of where they were the last few weeks. And then Russell 2000, they're starting to tilt short and they increase their volatility shorts. Again, market or speculators are betting on volatility going down. And I think we're getting very close to seeing a vol spike that will blow through the recent peak in the VIX and make a lot of people look like they're on the wrong side of the market. All right, let's jump over into the charts and I want to spend some time on TLT. Uh, let's go look at the yields first and then we'll come back to TLT and we'll compare that. Why I'm saying the bond prices are gonna lead the dollar higher, we'll look at the dollar. So we see kind of a technical bounce here on 10 year treasury yield after two disappointing auctions. Of course, with the Fed coming in pretty heavy handed tomorrow, and then back on Thursday with a, a long bond purchase, the yields aren't going anywhere anytime soon. How about 30 year right into this zone of where we've seen sellers on the 30 year. Now I've got two lines that I've kind of been using as support, but every time it gets in here, what do you see? People selling at this level, selling at this level. So they're down here and people are, again, selling at this level. It's no surprise. When we get a break of the 30 year of around 1.2, now you're right in shot at that all time low. And with the speculative positioning and the state of the market and credit growth, you can sell this thing could hit zero very, very quickly and very easily. So let's look at TLT. And I moved some lines up. I moved the, or I added this dotted line up here for a very specific reason. We see it got rejected. And why is this kind of like the, the last point of resistance? And I know it's hard to see, but it touched back there in late March, early April, mid April, late April, and then just recently here last week and now. This top up here, there's really not many sellers left to hang on to this. This is kind of the last line of what's resistant. Resistance. So let's zoom in on the 10 day chart and you can see it hit that line where there's sellers. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So sellers came in and brought prices down. Buyers came in, brought it where? Back to resistance. Sellers came in, buyers brought it back up. Right where to? Resistance, sellers came in. And where did the sellers end up? Well, they, they push price all the way back down to where the buyers were going back to Thursday and Friday. So that's pretty interesting. How about today's price action? You can see that it gets up to that dotted purple line comes, you know, we see support, 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 support broken, support now becomes re retest of resistance, retest at resistance, retest at resistance, sell, 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 sell until buyers come in. So am I concerned about that? Not at all. Why? Well, you've got the Fed buying this whole long bond situation up. They're, they're buying the curve up. That's what QE does, at least at lower rates. Look, if QE led to higher rates, where are they? Why are we talking about how bonds are about to break out? And they're very, very, very close. I mean, perhaps within a week or two, this thing takes off. And why does that really matter? because it leads to a massive unwinding of the market. Let's go back to 2008 and we pull the chart back down here. And let me, I'll draw a line for you if that helps. Uh, where's my line tool price level. So here, let's draw a line and look what happens back in late October, 2008. What happened? Boom, bond prices broke out of a multi-year resistance zone going back to 2000, maybe sooner, but back to 2003, you see it's stuck right under this trend line here and then boom, exploded higher. That was your big sell-off. And then after that, you got the market unwind and everything was kind of done. So let's compare this to the, the dollar. Well, let's go look at the dollar and then we'll compare it to it because everyone's counting the dollar out 
And as TLT is looking to break to new all-time highs as the 30 years looking to crash, what you see is we're in a very strong supply zone of where buyers have been on the dollar going back to 2015. You've seen buyers all the way along in here. And as I said, I think last week, don't be surprised if this gets at the top or even into the supply zone and people are now betting on the dollar just outright collapsing. Now, here's the thing. If you think you missed out on, on any rally in gold, if this indeed is a topping pattern and it's going to break through and go all the way down, there's still plenty of upside, lots of upside in gold and emerging markets and other inflation sensitive assets. If this holds here and goes higher, now you've got a severe problem for everybody who is say long gold, long EEM, long silver and short the dollar and there's tons of them. Let's take a look when we overlay TLT here and we're going to see what is likely to happen because we talk about um, okay did I do something wrong maybe and it studies oh there it goes let's change the color of that while we're here okay so we've talked about this relationship between stock prices and yield. So stock, when stock prices whoops, go up, yields need to rise to validate. By the same token, it goes the opposite direction. When yields are falling as they are and looking ahead much lower, it drags stock prices lower. Well, the same sim or a similar relationship exists between bond prices and the dollar. So if you look at TLT here being bond prices, and we have the dollar, normally the dollar is leading lower. So coming back here, say 2018, dollar led bond price is lower the dollar led bond price is higher and it kind of does this along the way but recently as of june bond prices have been going up now if this relationship where the dollar was leading bond prices was correct treasury yields would be back where they were 2018 let's go up and say 30 year yields would be way up near the high around 3.4%. And yet we're looking at what is very clearly a topping pattern where they're headed lower. So let's go back to the dollar. Now, what is the implications of this relationship right now? It says that one of the two are going to be right. Either bond prices are right and are going to continue going higher, which will drop, which will bring the dollar up. So you look here, bond prices went up, 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 up. The dollar was down, 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 down. And all of a sudden the dollar shot up like a boomerang, boing, catapult, straight up, went suborbital. Or it says the dollar's right and bond prices are wrong and yields are about to explode up. One of the two is right. One of them has the Fed buying it almost every day of the week. Oh, that would be bonds. The other has a strong correlation to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet that when the balance sheet goes up, it goes up. Oh, that would be the dollar. So the reality of the situation is for people that are bearish on the dollar, bullish on gold and all that stuff, they're on the wrong side of this fence because the Fed's balance sheet should start rising again because all those swap lines and repo loans, are all, they're all back pretty much at zero. And the Fed's still doing the 120 billion per month floor of QE, causes the balance sheet to rise, telling us that the dollar should go up and the bond prices should go up. Everything sort of makes sense here when we look at it from that perspective. And so as I think about kind of my macro thesis overall, I, I, was, I was thinking about it this weekend and I've never been more at peace with my view because I believe there's gonna be huge opportunity in, in inflation sensitive assets such as gold, silver, emerging markets, uh, tips and whatnot. But I think there's a huge pullback coming first. I think it's gonna look just like we saw uh, back in 2008 and 9, and let's go take a look and see uh, what we can glean from what happened then. Let's stretch this dollar chart out a bit, and we can see that in t late 2008, the dollar shot higher and then had a second shoot higher back uh, in 2000, late 2009, early mid 2010. Let's look at what happened to gold. And here we see 2008, it gets pulled back. See, everyone thought this is it. This is a big move. 
and it got yanked back down, created a tremendous buying opportunity for those who already made their money on bonds. Now, why does that matter when you make your money on bonds? Because depending on how far out the curve you are, and when I say that, how much duration you're taking in your bonds, you're effectively getting paid for the Fed to deflate the economy. So let's say you made you know 10% on your bonds. That means you have 10% more money to go buy other stuff when it's cheap. Maybe you made 30% when it blows up straight up. You have 30% more money. See, everybody's worried about missing out and they don't get how deflation works. It brings everything down. So what you've got here is this massive pullback that started in gold and kind of ended as, well, oh, let's see, in 10 of 08. Well, where did TLT peak? 12 of 08. So there you go. So they, so the bond market created a peak and then a nice exit to come in right in here and catch that big monster move up. So everybody thinks this is a big move. I think there's going to be a big pullback. Maybe, who knows, where, let's see, where, where, let's, let's have fun. Let's pick a number. I'm going to guess it's going to get potentially as low somewhere between maybe around 30, mid 1300 an ounce. Then you see the big move higher. That's what I think is going to happen. We'll see if that plays out. It'll be done just because there's a big bullish move in the dollar, big bullish move in the bond market. And who's doing it? It's the Fed. I mean, that's what I'm telling you. I have so much peace about my macro thesis right now. It's crazy. I mean, it used to be at night, I'd lay in bed thinking about it, wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. Not, not at all. I'm, I'm at total peace with how this is going to play out. And mainly because when I look at this chart of TLT and I zoom in and I look at this and see how it's on the edge of breaking out, this is just exactly what you get right before a major illiquidity or solvency event in the market. So the bond market is telling you something big is happening. The problem is... Nobody's listening. I'm Steve Admeter. Oh, before we, you know what I meant? We have questions. Hey, let's, let's do that. Uh, this is a questionable show uh, in many in many aspects. So let's take a look. Really enjoy the show. Your explanations on the markets gave me thinking a lot bigger, or I guess you could say thinking macro. I love it. Thinking macro. What are your thoughts on the real estate market right now? It seems to be a seller's market as prices continue to rise and demand seems to be high. With the foreclosure forbearance lasting another year, do you see the market losing steam soon or it'll be like this until late 2021? I'd love to mind my first home, but prices are all way out of my budget. Uh, look, I would love, if I was in the market to sell my home, I'd love to be selling it right now because it's a great market to sell. Because everybody thinks that what? Stocks are permanently high plateau. People think real estate permanently high plateau. I mean, we hear this all the time at peaks. It's ridiculous. Real estate, real estate prices are not immune to in deflation. And they're really not immune to 30 some million people on unemployment. Think about that for a while. How are all these people going to buy homes that are sitting on unemployment when all the demand is tapped out? What about all the people refining their homes recently? Are they moving? No. They're staying put. So I remain bearish on real estate. Save your money. Wait for the opportunity to buy. Maybe it is a year, maybe more. I don't know exactly when. All I know is you will see deflation in the real estate market. There's no such thing as permanently high plateaus. So far, it looks like impending Great Depression, like crash of doom and bonds to the moon, as the Fed does QE. However, after that, what happens? This is where I'm conflicted. And yeah, don't worry. I'm conflicted too. I mean, that, this is kind of how macro works. You get to the point where you're like, all right, I'm highly convicted on this is what happened. Then I'm somewhat con you know, convicted on what happens after that because I'm not sure exactly you know, how the cards are going to be dealt. You know, macro, you, 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 sometimes you just got to play the cards as they come out and you don't always know. You could think, I'm pretty sure this is what's going to happen, but maybe there's a new card that hits the table like, oh, hey, there's potential opportunity or something I didn't see coming. My follow-up question was going to be what your thoughts on possible outcomes after the big crash when the Fed does massive, massive, massive QE on another level by year's end or next year. Now, I'll, I'll shorten that. It's going to be this year. The bond market is telling us this year. And why is the Fed going to do a massive amount of QE? Let's look at what just happened with QE. Well, one, did it get people buying stocks? Yes. So people now think QE, or again, think QE leads to higher stock prices. So check for the Fed, they got that. Did it lead to lower interest rates that the Fed wanted? Yeah, it did that. 
And did it get some of the economic data going up? Well, it didn't, but nevertheless, they're going to call it that. So from the Fed's perspective, when they look at when Powell looks at what they did and it quote unquote worked, what do you think is going to happen when the economy rolls over and heads back down? What is always the case when it comes to monetary policy? Just do more. Hey, if if a trillion was enough, do 10. If that 10 was enough, do 100. Keep doing more. So he's going to come out the next time out of the gate and just drop the massive amount of QE. And it'll be this year because the bond market's already telling us that. Okay, let's go on. At that point, would the same thesis play out? Would we see the March-June mania again? It's entirely possible. You know, the March-June mania was born on the fact that people got stimulus checks. Now, the how long can the government keep stimulating the economy? They can't do it perpetually. You can only borrow so much out of the economy before you choke it. Now, we've gone past that level already. And I've said the tax cut was a mistake because look now, we could use another tax cut. Not going to happen. I mean, where you, what's left? Okay, I get that President Trump wants a payroll tax cut. It's going to be not it's so insignificant in the big picture. So now we can't do any more tax cuts because we did them all. Well, we just sent people more money than they needed. And I said, that was a mistake. I didn't say sending people money was a mistake. I said sending people too much money was a mistake. Now Congress is looking at the fact that they, we, we can't do as much. So what's going to happen when this thing rolls over and heads lower? No tax cut, maybe some stimulus if they can do it. They effectively shot all the bullets in the gun. There's nothing left. So do I think there's necessarily going to be a huge surge higher in stocks? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Or does the system break completely and we never recover? That's not the case. <laughs> I doubt this since we're all, the world will always need American U.S. dollars. That's true. You know, I've said we are set up to look at a uh, bottom that's going to look like the Great Depression. What happened after the Great Depression? Ten years of austerity. You know, we got to the point where everyone stopped believing in monetary policy, and the answer was get the debt paid down. There's just too much debt, and it took 10 years to pay it off, and that worked. And then it didn't work, so we had to have a world war, and that you know, really sort of helped quite a bit. So I look at the fact is at some point people stopped believing in monetary policy, then you have a period of austerity, and then maybe a war or something. I know some, a lot of people think the wars come sooner than that. They usually don't until later but they usually do happen. I'm really struggling to put this together as an in-game strategy. With my, my initial thought was perhaps money supply is growing and people aren't spending equals deflation. Yeah, well, look what's going to happen as people are not going to get as much money starting, well, now. All that money that they put into savings is going to have to use to supplement their, you know, bills. They're going to have to use it to pay their, not supplement, they're going to need it to pay their bills. So I suspect that the M2 should start drawing down, you know, oh, if we don't see a stimulus this say this entire uh, next month, I think it should be very obvious in the data that the M2 starts to drop. Of course, the monetary base will continue to rise. It's highly deflationary. The, then the big crash and all from now until January, who knows? After the spending returns, maybe, it, it, you know, it, where is the spending coming from? New stimulus, where are you gonna get the money from? Again, the, the government is choking people or choking the economy out. There's only so much you can borrow before and it doesn't matter if there's an unlimited ceiling in how much the government can borrow there is a limit to how much they can borrow and supply side is limited because we lose our world trading friends now nah, the people still want to export to us don't worry they still want to we technically have the best demographics and they're not that great uh, everything is just harder to produce ship and move maybe prices go up um, i don't know maybe but everyone has more currency to buy with? I don't know. Inflation eventually plays out. The only way you get inflation is you get lending growth. The you know, Fed doesn't create inflation. The mark, the, the economy does when people borrow. Is there going to be a demand to borrow? You, you think baby boomers are going to go out and borrow? No, they're paying their debt off. How about millennials? You know, With a massive amount of unemployment and a crashing market, are they going to run out and borrow? Doesn't look like inflation to me. Then interest rates have to go up fast. I think there'll be a spike in rates, but I don't think after that they go up anymore. But it's too late. Another market crash. Bonds win again. Yeah, I, I can go with that. People get fed up with the Fed. Well, they might be, but good luck getting rid of them. And we instill a world centralized currency. Um, we won't, but the if that comes out, it'll be because the central bankers 
around the world decide that's the next direction we to go we need to go so you know, the reality of the whole situation is there's there's a certain point in the macro where you know it gets fuzzy and that's okay because you, you don't know what's exactly is going to happen and i don't either it's just probabilities you start looking at things and what is most likely to occur and then you just have to be open and just sit at the table and wait for the cards to be played and be ready to analyze them and move forward and say okay that card i wasn't expecting to come out what does it mean that card i wasn't expecting to come out what does it mean and then you've got to adapt quickly as an investor and that is how it works I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for taking the time to watch. We'll be back on Wednesday to see what a whole lot of nothing the Fed has to say and if my predictions are right, plus whatever inter other interesting things show up in the market. Hope you have a great day. I'll see you then. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. It shows not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by a security, financial product instrument, or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Meter. Personal capacity opinions expressed in this video that do not reflect the view of Alice Financial Advisors, Inc. or Steve Van Meter Financial.